Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Stephen Hansen, Associate Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Selena Koch, Executive Editor. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. On this week's pod, we'll be discussing upcoming data at the American Association of Cancer Research meeting that shows the potential of the CAR-T field moving closer to tackling solid tumors. In addition, ALS patients and stakeholders await FDA's advisory committee discussion on Amelix's ALS candidates on Wednesday after the agency released briefing documents that raised questions about the reliability of efficacy data. Well, we're going to be kicking off with this AACR data that came out from the abstracts. So, Lauren, I believe you waded through a deluge of AACR abstracts last week, um, looking at a lot of the innovation going on around CAR T therapies and solid tumors. Maybe a good place to start off would be why have solid tumors been such a challenge for this modality? Yeah, I think there are two main challenges. One is the targets, and one is accessing the tumors um, with immune cell therapies. The issue with targets for solid tumors is selectivity. In hematological cancers, or at least B-cell cancers, you don't necessarily need a target that's entirely selective for the cancer cells over the healthy B-cells because patients can tolerate a temporary B-cell depletion. But that's often not the case with solid tumors, where the targets may be expressed on cells of, of certain organs where you can't tolerate a transient disruption of function, or that don't regenerate quickly. And then with uh, uh, the other target issue would be heterogeneity. Solid tumors are generally pretty heterogeneous. And um, so even if you do find a selective target, you might not eliminate the tumor as effectively as you would if, if it were consistently expressed. And then accessing the tumors, it's just the fact that solid tumors have an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment that does a pretty good job of shielding them from immune cells like CAR T cells. Right, right. So what were the strategies that were presented at AECR that companies are kind of taking to try and make CAR Ts work in solid tumors? Can you give us some highlights from uh, from what, what innovations they're making there? Sure. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting. They've sort of described strategies in these abstracts to touch on all of the different problems. Most of them are still preclinical, so it'll be interesting to see what actually ends up working. But on the target side, one strategy is just finding better targets. When companies started bringing CAR T cells into solid tumors, it seemed like they were really stuck on a few different solid tumor antigens that seemed to be pretty selective. But now there's, there's a growing diversity of targets. I took a look at what's actually in the clinic, and there are almost 20 different solid tumor targets for CAR T cells now, which will be in a different story this week. We also found, I think it was 13 in the AACR abstracts. These are new targets that are not addressed by any clinical CAR T-cell programs that could be potential targets for the future. But it wasn't just new targets. There's also strategically different mechanisms people are using, right, Lauren? Yeah. So there are also ways to target antigens that are not entirely tumor selective, um, in a way that still makes the CAR T cell tumor selective. So one of the big themes that we saw was these dual targeting CAR T cells. The strategy for making these selective is to use logic gates so that you can create a CAR T cell that's um, only activated when two targets are present or one that's activated when you've got one target present, but not another target. So that can add another layer of selectivity. So when um, you say a logic gate, you're sort of talking like an and this X and Y or X, but not Z kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, the dual CAR T's are also pretty cool, even if you ignore the logic gates, because that can address the heterogeneity problem. So if you just have a CAR T that expresses two targets, you can hit more of the cancer cells and you can address this escape mutant problem that's happening with the, the B cell CAR T cells, um, which is when the tumor cells evolve to lose expression of the CAR T's target and can then evade detection by the therapy. So do you still have a problem with those ones of off target activity? I don't think that would address the off target problem. I mean, I maybe you could, it, it depends how complicated you make the cell, right? Right. And also it may depend on how you dose it. 
you might be able to. Yeah, that was that was another thing that we saw was not necessarily dosing, but some companies are trying to tune the binding affinity for certain targets to try to sway them toward tumor cell selectivity based on how much they're expressed, how, how exactly they bind. You'd mentioned, Lauren, about that access to the tumor microenvironment. I mean, did we see any interesting innovations around sort of cell engineering or ways to be able to allow those cells to better get into these uh, immune, immune suppressed tumors? Yeah, so something that we've been seeing for a while is gene editing or, or different gene expressions that will make the CAR T cells either more persistent or um, better able to reproduce or things like that, or to actually evade the immune system. So that's not necessarily new, but there are some interesting targets that came up in the abstracts that might be more new. One, there was one abstract that I thought was really cool that was a CAR T cell that secretes a bispecific antibody. And so what the, the bispecific antibody does not target a tumor antigen. In this case, it was targeting the tumor stroma cells. So the idea was that the bispecific directs the T cells to the tumor stroma cells, kills those, and then opens the door for the CAR T cell to then go in and access the tumor cell. So uh, <laughs> it seems like a crazy idea, but maybe maybe it could work. Sort of like almost like plowing the road for the CAR Ts to be able to get through the uh, to get through the stroma. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I know that this isn't going to be our only crack at AECR. What else do we have coming up on tap for uh, for AECR either this week or in the coming weeks? I know that we will be having our characteristic look where we try to identify other new targets that first appear at AECR. So that will be coming out soon. And Stephen, want you to remember and remind all our audience that talking of targets, we have a new distillery dashboard. So several times on the pod in the past, our colleague Karen Catch tusman has talked about the distillery, which brings cutting edge translational papers from the academic literature, those that have translational relevance, and we distill those. And we've been doing this for actually seven years. And what we've now got is a very, very cool interactive dashboard that allows you to search through these either by target or looking for a specific innovator or looking for who are the top investigators in certain areas, either geographic areas or therapeutic or technology areas. So take a look at that, biocentury.com slash distillery. Good, good reminders, Simone. Thank you for that. It's been already interesting digging through the distillery's dashboard, and I'm sure more stuff will be coming that's very interesting over the coming weeks. Moving from that early stage to the other end of the spectrum, to the regulatory stage, we can't go this week without talking about what is a fairly important day for a lot of folks in the ALS community. This Wednesday, the FDA's Peripheral and Central Nervous Systems Drug Advisory Committee will be discussing an NDA for AMX0035 from Emelix, a drug that patient groups have been aggressively lobbying should receive a fast approval based on initial data from a phase two, three trial. But FDA has now published this morning its briefing documents for the meeting. Selena, I know you've had a little bit of time to sort of look through these. Can you give us a sense of what the main takeaways are from the briefing documents or what, what's your read on FDA's position here? Yeah, I think... The first thing to note that it doesn't appear from FDA's posturing that this review is going to go the same way as Adihelm and Alzheimer's, which was a concern and is something a lot of people have been talking about because, you know, early on FDA had said Amelix would need to give them data from a phase three trial and then due to lots of presumably pressure from patients and patient advocates, they they did an about face on that and said, go ahead, submit with the phase two. So that what the company submitted was data from one trial, which is a phase two trial. So in the case where you're trying to get approval on one trial, you need to have, I think the way it's phrased is very persuasive statistical result. And what FDA is saying here in its briefing documents is it, it doesn't see that. It doesn't see the data as very persuasive for a whole slew of reasons. Right. And the question, and I believe there's one question, right, that they're asking the panel to discuss and vote on, and that's related to essentially just looking at how effective the drug was from the single trial. That's right. Yeah, it's a question about efficacy. The questions around efficacy are 
one, the, the primary analysis had a statistically significant p-value, but it was the FDA described it as borderline, and it called into question the statistical method they used to get it. And then if you look beyond that primary, there's really no supporting data from any of the secondary endpoints that could bolster that primary analysis. Then there were some problems early on, too. There's like a kit distribution problem that messed up randomization of the first 18 or so patients. They all went on treatment. Then the drug, it tastes bitter and it causes GI problems. So there's concerns about functional and blinding, at least the possibility of it. And then, so with the, the primary endpoint is like the standard rating scale for functional decline. And built into Amelix's analysis is an assumption that disease progression is going to be linear. Mm. But there's no reason why it necessarily is going to be linear. And that's an FDA saying, look, that's something that needs to be established, not assumed. And then it goes on from there. They're, they have quite a few. Right. And, and I believe one of the big things that had some of the ALS patient groups excited was this initial analysis or sort of preliminary analysis around survival. I believe that sort of went a similar way, unfortunately, I think, for the company in, in terms of how FDA was viewing the survival data. Yeah, it, it definitely did. So there was no survival data at the end of the 24-week main study that was blinded, you know, everything. Right. Um, and no indication of survival benefit then. But then there was the open label extension and there was just a lot of dropout between the two at the beginning. And then there was more dropout during. So it's a a small population getting much smaller and it wasn't pre-specified. The look at survival only, like time to survival, that was not pre-specified, multiplicitively adjusted, all the things FDA likes to see. Right. And and then I believe there was also, so they had a cutoff, I believe that was about data cutoff from about around a year ago. And I think if I recall right, FDA pointed out that there were then even more deaths that came after that, which if you include those. Erodes the effect. Erodes the effect even more and pushes it into sort of non-significance. Yeah. uh, And Amelix didn't collect this data. It was like a third party getting it through, I guess, medical records. And when people were lost to when they dropped out, there was no indication of how they were cared for and other things like that. Right. But this, I guess, you know, to me, this is one of these cases where I think it, and I would welcome everyone's sort of opinion on this. I think it's, it's interesting to hear how people think about this because the one thing that we haven't touched on yet is the safety for this drug, right? Where I think you mentioned GI effects that were sort of transient and only kind of came in the first couple of weeks of treatment, but what some of the, at least The patients have been pushing is that otherwise it's a pretty safe drug. So we've seen instances where FDA has been pushing, you know. Stephen, we're in like Sarepta territory is what you're saying here. So (laughs) I'm asking, I'm wondering. (laughs) Let's let's make one thing. I think one thing is really important to point out about ALS that is distinct from certainly Alzheimer's. It's the opposite from that. and, And even DMD to some degree. So when people are diagnosed with ALS, quite often it is within two to three years of that diagnosis that they die. And that means that an extension of months, something that, you know, even in cancer, we sometimes question the importance of that, but that's very important to these folk. And then getting to what you're talking about, Stephen, which is, hey, it's safe, you know, it's tolerated. You know, a lot of them with that kind of outlook will say, I don't really mind how toxic it is. I have nothing else. And Mm. if it has a chance of helping me, and that's where the Sarepta story came in, where they said, if it does no harm, why not just give these kids that drug? Because there's nothing else and there's nothing to lose. But they had a very... Can FDA do that? You can't just approve water and make people make money from it. So That's right. And Sarepta had a very strong genetic rationale for the mechanism of their therapy that's not the same here Mm -hmm. right that is true True. and there's no biomarker well there was a biomarker tested neurofilament which it trended in the wrong direction now that could be they measured the wrong biomarker the one of the two components in the therapy has some anti-inflammatory action maybe they should have looked at neuroinflammation but whatever they didn't they don't have that Still, there are patient advocates out there saying, okay, but FDA doesn't necessarily need a surrogate endpoint in the sense of a biomarker. Its statute says an intermediate endpoint will suffice. And and the other argument that they use to prop it up is that ALS is both a very rare disease and a highly heterogeneous one. So there's a lot of different disease mechanisms at play and you have a small trial size. So it's gonna be noisy. It's gonna be really hard to get a very persuasive p-value because of the nature of the disease and the lack of biomarkers. 
So if it works in 2% of people, just give it to us. Everybody will take it. Those 2% will keep taking it. Everybody else will stop taking it. Just give it to us. Right. And, and that is the patient position, which mm -hmm. is very easy to sympathize with, which is our disease is so difficult and so bad that if it does no harm, FDA should let something through. And that is counter to many, many drug developers. I think I can probably say most, but we don't actually have statistics on this perception that, you know, and this is what came up with Sarepta, that that is a slippery slope, that FDA can't just approve things just because they do no harm. They have to only be approving things that show demonstrated benefit. Selena, you've, you've carved this thing where you say if it's benefit for 2% of the population of the patient population, obviously, that then becomes this very difficult call for FDA. But, you know, they have to... It does, because know, it's... The question is how, how convinced do they have to be? For you get into the uh, territory of anecdotes, right? You have these individual right, right. patients who are like, look, I was declining, I got on the drug, I stabilized, right? It worked for me. It might not work for anybody else, but as long as it works for a handful of people, just give it to us. Uh, but you got to have some kind of standard somewhere, right? because there are studies on the progression of ALS and it's not necessarily linear. It can be faster in the beginning. It can be faster at the end stage and it, you can have periods where it kind of levels out. So somebody can say that they think the drug is the reason they've kind of stabilized recently, but you can't know unless you devise a test with a placebo and <laughs> a statistical measure. This is how, why we do science. Your heart goes out to them, but at the same time, you're like, we do have to set a standard somewhere, you know, where? Yeah. You know, I think those anecdotes are going to be, um, on that, 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 that is the power of the, I mean, it's on Wednesday, they've, I think they've increased the public hearing meeting part to one and a half hours now. So I think they've added more time because I think just in anticipation of the number of patients, I think that will, you know, be, be wanting to share their stories, which, as you say, I mean, you know, it's not to discount their experiences or what they've, what they've been through, but, um, you know, there has to be some way of, of, of capturing this, this benefit for us to. Yeah, I think one co what one codicil to this is to remember that it is incredibly bleak right now for patients. But Selena, you have written some stories going into depth on the number of different mechanisms. There's really quite a lot of investigational activity in this field. I think that there are a lot, partly from the um, ice bucket ice challenge, bucket. which everyone yes. remembers. I mean, this is a very active patient community and credit to them because things like that have actually triggered a lot of activity or supported a lot of activity with financing. And so it's not that there's this and then nothing for decades, at least we hope not. There's certainly a lot of activity, early stage activity and new mechanisms and ways of addressing the disease. Yeah, there, there's at least a dozen disease mechanisms. I, it's hard because it's a rapidly progressing 100% fatal disease. So Today's patients are like, we need something now, whatever it is, is give it to us. But if you do look at the longer term horizon, there is a lot of activity relative to other rare diseases. And, you know, there is some hope out there that we're going to figure it out and we'll eventually get to combinations is probably what's going to be needed, you know, biomarkers and combinations. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I know you're going to be following this closely on Wednesday, Selena. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more from that panel discussion and um, yeah. All of this we can find on uh, biocentury.com. Plus, I also want to plug our continuing the Biocentury show. So the latest edition of the Biocentury show is now available at biocenturyshow.com. It features Richard Hatchett of CEPI in conversation with Steve Usden. Hatchett cautions against complacency, warning that as bad as COVID-19 has been, the next pandemic could be far worse. He also outlines the steps CEPI is taking to improve preparedness for future pandemics. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcasts. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. <laughs>